Over the past few weeks, people have asked me if I was excited to speak here today. And I would tell them, yeah, absolutely. I was excited sometimes, but to be completely honest, I was also really scared. Every so often I was attacked by all these thoughts like, this is a bad idea, everyone's going to judge me, what if this has a negative impact on my future? And I actually almost ended up canceling this TED Talk. The reason I was so anxious is because I'm going to be talking about a topic that is extremely stigmatized in our society. I'm going to be talking about mental illness, particularly about eating disorders, and sharing my own personal experience. I was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa when I was 14, and although I consider myself to have recovered for approximately four years now, I've only recently found the courage to speak openly about this topic. My hesitation to give this talk was mainly due to stigma, and ironically, the whole point of my talk was to try to reduce the stigma in the first place. So I reminded myself, staying silent would only serve to perpetuate the stigma. And that's exactly why I'm here today. Many people with eating disorders stay silent because it's not something that's well understood and there are a lot of misconceptions around them. Something that typically happens is that people with eating disorders are blamed for their condition. They often get told things like, stop doing this to yourself, or come on, just snap out of it already. But here's the thing. Eating disorders are not a choice. There are serious mental illnesses that affect at least one million people in Canada alone. Eating disorders, particularly anorexia nervosa, have the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness. When I had anorexia, it felt like my mind was possessed by a demon that was constantly controlling my thoughts and my actions. Every day I woke up and there was this voice that was telling me that I needed to be thinner, and it felt like there was nothing I could do to ignore it. I started to cut out any junk food from my diet, and then I started to restrict my meals, and increasingly I was adding more rules about what I could and couldn't eat. I, every time before I ate anything, I would look at the label, and if it had any too much calories, fat, or sugar, I wouldn't eat it. I started getting into a lot of arguments with my family. Because I was forced to finish my meals when I was at home, I found ways to compensate for it. I started to exercise compulsively. At home, I would run up and down the stairs, I would do my homework while I was standing up, and I was constantly finding more ways to burn more calories. I started to lie a lot about what I was eating. I would hide food and throw it away when nobody was looking. So I started to restrict my meals and um, eventually my health was rapidly deteriorating. I was constantly cold. Um, my hair started to fall out and my skin became really dry. And I was emaciated, but for some reason, when I looked into the mirror, I couldn't see that. There was one point when I went to my doctor, and I don't remember the exact reason why, but I think it was something to do with the physical symptoms that I was feeling as a result of having, of being malnourished. And my parents were with me at the time. And my doctor took my vitals and announced that my heart rate was dangerously low, and I had to go to the hospital immediately because I was at severe risk for heart failure. My parents and I were shocked. When we got to the hospital, the doctors told me that I had to stay there until I was medically stable. And I was devastated because I didn't feel like I needed help. And I think it was probably because my mind was so full of these thoughts of food that I didn't have any mental energy left to pay attention to the physical damage that my body was doing with. Every day at the hospital, I was strictly monitored. For the first few weeks, I was not allowed to get out of bed. If I had to use the washroom, a nurse had to come in with a wheelchair and roll me over to the bathroom, which was a few meters away. I was put on very regulated and strict meals consisting of increasingly large calories. And every day a, a doctor would come in and tell me that I couldn't leave the hospital because my heart rate had to reach a certain level. 
So I ended up staying at the hospital for about six weeks. And what's crazy is that even throughout those six weeks, I was resistant to the idea that I had an eating disorder. I would plead that there were people who were eating less than I was, or that I was healthy in comparison to them. I was in denial, and denial is a common characteristic symptom of anorexia nervosa. But this denial is very much different from what we usually perceive as simply a manifestation of stubbornness or a defense mechanism. Although there isn't a clear understanding of what exactly causes this lack of awareness, studies suggest that starvation induces this defective information processing in the brain. And this is why so many people who are in that initial denial phase of the disorder will rarely seek treatment themselves. So after I left the hospital, I, was, I looked physically healthy, but I still had anorexia. There's a misconception that, by definition, people with eating disorders are stick thin. But an eating disorder is a mental illness, and you can't tell if somebody has one simply by looking at them. For example, they could have bulimia or a binge eating disorder, or they could be in partial remission from anorexia. These false perceptions can prevent sufferers from seeking help because it makes them believe that they aren't sick enough to deserve treatment. Recovery from an eating disorder is not easy. It often involves cycles of relapse and treatment. Although there is no cure for an eating disorder, I do believe that there was one specific event that catalyzed my recovery process. I was browsing the internet and I fell upon a scientific research paper on eating disorders. And as I read this paper, one thing I learned was that there are biological predispositions that make certain people more vulnerable to developing an eating disorder. For example, genetic heritability is thought to account for approximately 50 to 80% of the risk of developing an eating disorder. This made me realize that there were causal factors that were beyond my control. Another thing I learned was that there's a neuropsychological explanation for why I was behaving the way I did. It had to do with the way that the thoughts and emotions associated with my eating disorder were conditioned into my subconscious mind. And by nature of conditioning, it repeatedly expressed itself in the forms of thoughts, urges, emotions related to food and body weight. Although these research findings can't prove what's actually true, they still validated my feelings of worthlessness and confusion from not being able to control my thoughts and my actions. It's that moment when I realized that I had a mental illness, and that's when I really started to recover. The idea that eating disorders are self-inflicted is just one of the many misconceptions out there. It can be hard to understand the fact that eating disorders are not just about wanting to look thin. Although the symptoms can manifest as an obsession with food and weight, the underlying causes are much more complex and extend far beyond that. Eating disorders are often perceived as simply a Western phenomenon that only occurs in teenage girls. But in reality, eating disorders do not discriminate. They affect people of any size, gender, race, sexuality, and so on. In fact, it is estimated that one in four people suffering from an eating disorder are male. If you know someone who's struggling with an eating disorder, it can be very difficult to know what to say or what to do. I know it can be really tempting to just tell someone with anorexia that to so just eat more or blame someone who binge eats for having a lack of self-control. But that's not really helpful. In fact, the more people were confrontational to me about my eating disorder, the more it made me want to resist. And that's because of psychological reactance. It's something that we all do. It's the idea that when somebody tells us to do something, we perceive that as a threat to our freedom. And as a human instinct, we'll tend to react in the opposite manner in order to reassert that freedom. So instead, try recognizing when it's their eating disorder voice that's speaking and separate that from who they truly are. 
If you're struggling with an eating disorder, I want you to understand that it's not your fault. I know that you may feel completely powerless at times, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to overcome it. Because ultimately, you can. Recovery is very hard, but I promise you that life afterwards is so much better. And if you haven't done so already, I hope that you'll find the courage to seek help because without the love and support I got along the way, I wouldn't be here today. The theme of this conference is pushing the envelope. And to me, the envelope represents the stigma that surrounds mental illness. The envelope is a barrier to seeking treatment. It's the barrier to speaking up, and it's a wall between a sufferer and a helper. While it thrives off silence and misconceptions, it can be weakened through knowledge and awareness. So I invite you to help push on this envelope by educating yourself and others, by being compassionate, and by choosing empowerment over shame. Thank you.